greetings. Uh, I bring you greetings from Southern California where I am speaking to you today. Um, I'm at Southlands Church, which is a advanced church here in Southern California. Um, I wish I could be there with you in person in Africa, um, but obviously we're all kind of used to this remote virtual communication and interaction by now. And it's a blessing to be able to um, hopefully give you some um, edifying food for thought today um, across the, the um, distance of separate continents. Um, for those who don't know who I am, I'm Brett McCracken. Um, I am a writer, I'm a journalist, uh, I am an elder here at Southlands, but my full-time job is for the Gospel Coalition. If you're unfamiliar with the Gospel Coalition, um, the Gospel Coalition is a website that produces resources, articles, podcasts, videos, etc., sometimes events, to really have the goal of helping Christians connect the gospel, connect faith to all areas of life. Uh, whether, you know, education, parenting, uh, your vocation, your job. In my particular case, I focus on culture. How does Christianity interact with culture? How can we as Christians look around at the culture and um, pay attention to things that we need to notice, uh, things that reveal where kind of the heart of our culture is at? What is it, what is it longing for? Um, how can we start conversations with the culture? Uh, sometimes I write about areas of our culture that we as Christians need to uh, speak out against, um, things that we need to name as false, as unhelpful, as wrong. Um, sometimes it's about uh, highlighting the good in culture, the true, the beautiful in culture. So it's a fun job. I love it because there's all sorts of things in culture that are going on. It's complex, um, but it's so important that we as Christians are engaging that area. So today I'm going to explore some aspects of our culture, particularly some challenging aspects of our culture that I think we as Christians need to be aware of, uh, and especially the next generation of Christians who are going to be the leaders of the church in the next few decades. Uh, I think it's important that, that you, us, um, are just aware of some of the big challenges we're going to be facing in our culture and that we're equipped to um, be countercultural where we need to be. So I, I could say a lot about this area, uh, challenges in our culture for Christians. There's a lot of them. Um, I actually wrote a blog post a few years ago with the headline, 21 Challenges Facing the 21st Century Church. So I'm not gonna go through 21 challenges today. That would take a long time. Uh, but I am gonna go through five challenges. Um, it was hard to kind of think about which five to talk about today, but I hope the ones that I'm gonna talk about uh, resonate with you as challenges and I hope that I can give you just some helpful food for thought to think about how can I navigate these challenges as a Christian in a in a helpful way. Um, the, so three of the five challenges I'm going to talk about are related to technology because I think if there's kind of one big issue in our culture that is shaping everything uh, and that we really need to be kind of mindful of and tracking with its technology. So Three of the five challenges are, are related to technology in different ways, and the other two are just uh, more general uh, kind of issues or trends that I see in our, in our culture. So with that, let me just dive in to, uh, to the first of the five cultural challenges that I think you will face as a Christian leader in your generation. The first one I'm going to talk about is, I call it information overload. We live in a world of a lot of information, right? More information is at our fingertips today, literally in our pocket, in our smartphone, than any generation of humans had access to before. And in some ways, that's a great thing, right? Any question you might have, anything you might be interested in, curious about, you can just quickly like click, you know, two clicks and you're there, right? You have an answer, you're on your way to an answer. But I actually think that the more information we have at our fingertips, the, the less wise we have become. Uh, in my new book, The Wisdom Pyramid, that's the first sentence of the book. It says that we have more and more information in our world, but less and less wisdom. So I actually think there is such a thing as too much information, too much information to know what to do with, where to begin, how to make sense of it all. Um, so just a, a few aspects of this information overload problem that I think are worth noting and being aware of. 
Um, one is that it's actually hurting our brains and there's, there's real science, neuroscience that is showing this. So our brains in the digital age are so overstimulated. There is so much data, so much stimulation coming out our brains all day, every day, right? You open your phone, we're constantly scrolling through our devices, uh, we're watching this video, we're clicking on this, we're seeing that tweet, and our brains are spending all of this energy just kind of playing triage, like sorting through it instantly. Like, do I need to file this away? Is this a trivial bit of information? Is this important? And what's happening and what research is showing is that because the brain is spending all of its energy on that level, just kind of the superficial triage level, there's nothing left in for the brain to kind of do deeper level thinking. So critical thinking, um, actually like taking time to evaluate information, to make connections, to synthesize information, is actually a, 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 th a capacity that is being reduced uh, for our brains in the digital age. And that's a problem, right? If, if we're no longer able as Christians to think critically, to evaluate information in this information glut environment that we live in, uh, then that's a really severe problem. Another problem with the too much information world that we live in is that when, when there's limitless space on the internet for information, and there is, right? There's no boundaries, right? Um, any idea, any community, any tribe, whatever, any conspiracy theory can find fertile ground on the internet to kind of grow and develop. And so what ends up happening is that we kind of start Googling to find the information that we want to find because it, we can find anything on the internet. It's just so vast, there's so much information. We tend to kind of go towards the things that reinforce our beliefs. So for example, with the COVID pandemic, um, whatever you wanted to believe about the pandemic, you could probably just quickly Google and find some statistics, some evidence, some study, some expert that could back you up. And that sort of behavior is happening on any number of issues. Whatever the issue, whatever the debate, what you want to believe, you can just find something online in a quick Google search because the internet is so vast. So that's another problem with the too much information landscape that we live in. Another big one is just that our lives are increasingly um, filled up with content 24-7. So we, we wake up, we look at our phones, we're instantly being mediated by content. And all day, every day, until we go to sleep, we're doing that, right? We're, we've come to this point where anytime we have a gap in our day, whether it's uh, stopping at a stoplight in our car, waiting for our coffee at a coffee shop for like 90 seconds, what do we do? Instead of just being silent or being still, we pull out our phone and we start scrolling. We don't have anything in particular we're doing. It's just a habit that we've been conditioned into to fill every open moment of our lives with content. And this is actually, it's important to note that this is what the tech companies, the social media companies want us to do, right? They get more money to the extent that we are hooked on their platform, that our eyeballs, that our attention is always looking at something that they have to offer us. And so the algorithms are are very sneaky at kind of figuring us out, figuring out what we want, what we like, and serving that up to us constantly in this endless buffet of content, uh, this endless conveyor belt of content. And if we're not intentional about resisting that, we will easily become totally overwhelmed with content, and that's not a good thing. Because for Christians, we have to remember that wisdom comes often in the silences of our lives, the moments where we can breathe and rest and reflect and have space to actually process things. But if we're filling every open moment of our lives with media and content, then we don't have that and we're not going to be wise. One final thing I'll say about the too much information challenge of our culture is when, when there's kind of too many choices out there, uh, it leads to kind of commitment paralysis, right? Um, some of you might relate to this experience of going on to like Netflix or Disney Plus or any of the streaming sites and you're like, I want to watch something, but you, you end up spending an hour just scrolling through all of the options. There's too many options, right? And then after an hour of, of trying to decide what to watch, you're like, I give up. I, I, it, I, I don't have time to watch anything. <laughs> 
it's it's Netflix paralysis is the term that I that I give it. And this is kind of what we see throughout the internet, right? There's too many options, and so we never we struggle to commit to anything out of FOMO, right? Fear of missing out on something else. And this can translate to things like church, and I see this happening all the time because we're in this uh, over choice consumeristic environment in our culture. We now apply that to things like church. Why would I commit to church when there's this endless array of other options out there? All of this media, all this content that I could be uh, engaging with, why would I commit to, to a weekly rhythm of going to church? So this is why it's important and concerning for us as Christians. In a world of too much information, we can be distracted from mission, we can be detached from community, and our commitments can be eroded, right? And it all makes us unwise. So we need to be able to unplug, we need to be able to kind of have unmediated space in our lives, and we need to be okay missing out on a lot of what's happening on the internet. We need to be more present in our communities, and we need to be able to commit to things like church, even in a world of all these other options. Okay, that was a lot. That was probably too much information about the too much information problem. So sorry about that, but <clears throat> let me move on to the second cultural challenge that I want to talk to you about today, and that is something that I call disembodied life. So here, the challenge with technology is not just that it takes up all of our time, but that it removes us more and more from physical space. It sucks us into a virtual disembodied existence where the realities of the physical world right around us, right in front of us, don't matter. And over time, the realities of the physical world, including our physical bodies, begin to feel less and less real to us than our digital lives and our kind of avatars and our digital expression of ourself. I'm sure many of you, like me, have friends out there who you you rarely spend time with in person, but um, you know you, ha you still have a relationship with, and it's it's uh, entirely virtual. You kind of keep up with each other uh, through Instagram stories, or watching each other's TikToks, uh, or other forms of digital communication. Like this is what I'm talking about. We are increasingly living our lives virtually, mediated by screens, and of course, the COVID-19 pandemic accelerated this trend so that even with our next door neighbor who's physically, you know, 50 meters away from us, we, we, we saw them more through screens in the last year than we saw them in person, in the flesh. Everything was on Zoom, everything was on uh, technology. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that there are not benefits to these technologies. There certainly are. I'm so grateful that I can stay in touch with people who live far away. I'm so grateful for FaceTime, for Skype, WhatsApp, uh, all of those technologies. And without technology, of course, I wouldn't be able to communicate with you as I'm doing right now from another content continent. But I will say that the ease with which we do this today, we can live our lives connecting digitally uh, through smartphones, through the internet. Uh, it can gradually distort our sense of reality. God made us as physical creatures. He made us as embodied people, right? We're meant to be in real physical communities in tangible ways. And in a world where it's increasingly tempting to live our lives through devices, to live in this virtual space, we have to be intentional about choosing embodied life. So um, just a few more thoughts on this. I think there are some specific reasons why this is so important for Christians particularly. One is that the church is a fundamentally embodied experience. Um, virtual church, as I hope we all came to realize once and for all this last year, is no substitute for physical church, right? Church is not just about listening to a sermon on a podcast. Church is not just about watching Hillsong videos on YouTube, right? Uh, church is a physical place. It's fundamentally a physical place where you can rub shoulders, where you can stand alongside brothers and sisters in Christ, where you can break physical bread together in communion, where you can sing, shake hands, do all these physical actions together, right? 
it's awkward at times of course you know because physical reality can be awkward sometimes there's a smelly person sitting in the seat next to you at church sometimes there's someone who sings way too loud off tune you know and that's awkward but it's beautiful and this is what church is it's an awkward but essential community for us as christians so that's one way that we need to be countercultural in a disembodied world we need to embrace the embodied expression of the church another problem that i see with this kind of disembodied virtual existence is that it can tend towards uh, a detachment from local living local community uh, where where i think ultimately we can be more effective as as christians on mission the internet has a lot of good things about it um, but one thing that it does that isn't always helpful is that it gives us access constantly to a world's worth of problems right you open your phone you open social media instantly you are made aware of some atrocity some injustice some um, horrible thing happening far away on the other side of the world um, and while it's a good thing to be aware to some extent and it's a good impulse uh, to see that stuff and to feel outrage and to feel um, upset um, it can be bad when the cumulative effect of that is that we spend all of our emotional energy getting upset about the problems of the world virtually that we see through the internet from all of, all corners of the world that we have no energy emotionally or spiritually left to tend to the problems, the injustices in our own backyard, that we can ultimately have more power to address and change. I see this, I see people in my own friend group, in my own church who they're, they're so online, they spend so much of their daily lives on social media, on the internet, that um, they can, they're very conversant about some cause some injustice that's happening in another state or another part of the world but they couldn't tell you much about what's happening in our own city uh, uh, challenges injustices that they can actually address here and that's a problem right uh, we're all more effective god created us all as physical beings to be effective on mission in physical locations um, so that's another challenge of the disembodied nature of the internet um, and then finally one other challenge with this is when we live our lives mostly virtually, um, we can start to become detached from our own bodies, our own biology. Uh, we can become detached from the natural material world God has created. Um, I think that this is one of the reasons um, why something like transgenderism is a thing today. Transgenderism is nothing if not uh, built on the idea that my personhood is an idea. It's an abstract virtual idea that has no necessary connection to physical reality. My biological reality has no bearing on myself as I perceive it to be, right? That's only an idea that can gain traction in a virtual world where we live our lives, where our, our expressions of self are through our avatars, through this kind of disembodied self. So we need to push back against that as Christians and be the people who embrace the beauty and the givenness of the physical world. Nature, God's, you know, how he designed things, how he created things to be in all of its beauty and all of its limitations. I think wisdom in life is often embracing limitations and, and creation, nature reminds us of our limitations. We are creatures, we are not the creator. The world is not ours to just invent as we think it up. The world is ours to receive with gladness and gratitude uh, from the creator. Okay, so that's enough on, on that challenge, disembodied life. So the third challenge uh, that has to do with technology is uh, an impatient pace. So our, our technological age we live in is so sped up. It is such a relentlessly fast, hurried, frenetic, pace um, and it, it's it is showing no signs of slowing if anything it's kind of getting even faster with every uh, year that we're living in the internet age and this is problematic for a number of reasons one is that we it tends to create this kind of um, addiction to novelty as a culture where everything is about what's happening now what's trending now what's buzzworthy now uh, and we're and to go back to kind of the algorithms like serving up constant array of things for us 
it's this it's this fast moving cycle of like consuming this video and then before you even finish watching the video there's like a watch this next like ad for the next thing and that's how we live our lives in this fast paced digital environment we go from thing to thing to thing to thing and it's a mile wide and an inch deep we're just constantly consuming and we're never reflecting we're never stopping long enough to think critically about what we're consuming uh, to reflect on it um, and uh, and that's a problem, right? When we go too fast to reflect and to think critically, a whole host of problems uh, can come about. Uh, this is also true of the news. Have you noticed recently that like every piece of news is breaking news, right? Um, there's always some, some sort of like big headline, some sort of breaking news happening. And, and really, is there that much breaking news in the world on any, on any given moment? I don't think so, but the, the media companies are incentivized to make us uh, feel the urgency, right? They want to hook us so that we're constantly tuning in to find out what is the next big breaking news headline that I need to be upset about or you know on edge about. Um, but this constant churn of news, like you know, is so fast that we rarely remember like what was breaking news yesterday. I don't recall, let alone last week or last month. So we are so present tense focused uh, that we have a very short term memory and the speed of our culture and the fixation on the present tense, what's trending, what's happening now, it also has the negative effect of disconnecting us from history, disconnecting us from the future. Um, if everything's focused on the now, then we don't have this big picture perspective. And that's where wisdom, I think, is found, right? When you lose perspective because you're so, you have such tunnel vision for what's trending now, what's happening now, what is everyone obsessing about on Twitter now, then we're cut off from so many resources in history that can actually help us make sense of the present. And we're cut off from the big picture future that as Christians should give us a great perspective to kind of work through the problems of our day. So there's a lot of dangers in this kind of fast paced, present tense focus. One of the dangers, of course, is just for our personal uh, behavior online. The speed of things on the internet is not conducive to um, wisdom in speech, right? So often on the internet, we are beckoned to share our opinions and to sound off on any given debate way too quickly. Uh, we do not follow the wisdom of James in scripture when he says, um, be slow to speak, be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. We do the exact opposite on social media, right? We are quick to speak, quick to become angry, uh, and, and slow to listen. So we get ourselves into trouble when we do that, right? We go too fast for our own good. We go too fast to Kind of sufficiently vet information before we sh we share it like we share some, an article on social media and later it turns out to be false and we're like oh man i was gullible i shared that and it turned out to be false um, this is why conspiracy theories are are such a problem today they go viral because no one is taking the time to investigate them to vet them to think critically about it uh, the pandemic really highlighted this problem um, it, the pandemic was such a huge, global, complex, unfolding problem, but because of our addiction to instant information and instant opinions and perspectives, there were all sorts of ideas and perspectives and you know expert opinions that were going around, much of which were either completely wrong or partially wrong, and it just created this mess where at the end of the day, we don't trust anyone anymore because enough of the information being shared is not quite right. So all of this comes from just a too fast pace where we don't slow down, we're not patient enough to evaluate information and to think critically about it. One more thing about the pace problem that I think for Christians particularly is, is something we need to be aware of is when we don't slow down enough, uh, not only does it impair our ability to think critically, but it also hurts us spiritually, right? To have a vibrant spiritual life, we need to be able to slow down, to be still, to be still and know that God is God, to rest in him, to be, um, to be aware of our limitations. Like 
we have to rest we have to sleep and it's a good thing it's a good thing to be off you don't have to be online all the time you don't have to be aware of everything happening in the world sometimes I think the wisest thing to do is just to stare at a blank wall for 10 minutes rather than cram those 10 minutes with a few more tweets or a podcast or something else just take that time to reflect and be still and pray you know in order to have a vibrant prayer life today we have to be so countercultural in refusing to go with the hurried pace of our culture um, bible study all the disciplines that that make up a healthy christian life will require us to not get caught up in the frenetic pace uh, and speed of our culture so okay so that's the third one impatient pace so uh, I'm going to move on to the fourth challenge, and this one is not necessarily related to technology. This one is what I call politics as the new religion. This is a challenge that I think we're already facing, and I think we're going to be facing more and more, because in a secular age, in a, in a world that is secularizing, and certainly in the West that's happening, maybe not as much or not as quickly in places like Africa, um, but in America right now, we are officially a post-Christian nation and we're becoming more and more secular. But humans are wired for religion. We're wired for something bigger than ourselves. Some sort of, we have a spiritual need inside of us that will be filled with something. And so there's a lot of kind of candidates to kind of be the new religion in a secular age. Maybe it's the arts, maybe it's just the self, um, worshiping the self. Um, but I think politics is, is kind of poised to be kind of the big new religion for a lot of people. Uh, it kind of offers this purpose, this transcendent purpose beyond the self that religion used to offer people. But there's a lot of problems with this, and especially as it kind of tempts Christians to also sort, sort of elevate politics a little bit higher than it needs to be. I'm seeing this in America a lot and it's very concerning. I'm seeing a lot of Christians who see their political identity today as almost more important than their faith identity. Some Christians in America I see that they're so shaped by their politics that they would rather have an atheist member of their own political party over for dinner than someone at their church who shares their faith and shares their church but maybe doesn't have identical political opinions they would rather not have them over for dinner they'd rather have a relationship with the atheist who shares their political views i'm seeing a lot of things like that um, i'm seeing christians who are spending more energy campaigning for political causes political candidates than they are evangelizing about jesus campaigning about jesus i'm seeing more people who are preaching you know some political cause than they are preaching the gospel more christians who are doing that um, christians who are more interested in converting someone to their political party than they are converting someone to the kingdom of god to say yes to jesus and that's tragic right when our political identity becomes uh, the ultimate thing for us as christians it will naturally warp our christianity and it'll, it'll create this horrible witness in the world where suddenly our Christianity serves our politics and not the other way around. So this is a terrible trend for Christians um, who are being led to see partisan politics as more important than the kingdom of God. Um, but for those without faith, um, it isn't that politics is distorting their religion, it's that politics is their religion. It, it's just all there is. It's a religion substitute. And again, it, this, this makes sense, right? Because politics does offer a compelling purpose. It offers that like transcendence. If, if, they're, if you're a secular person, an atheist perhaps, you don't believe in eternity, heaven, hell, then all there is is now, right? And so politics is about what, how can we make the world better now? How can we address problems now? And, and if, so if that's your perspective, then politics is everything, right? Everything hinges on us and what we do in this generation. So I can see why politics is becoming a religion for a lot of people. Now, I, I do want to say that, you know, I'm not, I'm not suggesting politics is unimportant. Um, I do think that it is important and it will be key for the next generation of Christian leaders to 
uh, to value politics, but here's the thing. We have to value it in an appropriate way. We have to see it in a way that puts politics in its rightful place as something that can come alongside our mission where it can uh, and serve the mission, um, but not the other way around. Like politics is one way that uh, we can kind of positively make an impact as Christians in the world, but it's not the only way. And it's absolutely crucial that the partisan politics of any particular nation, wherever you are at, wherever you're watching this, it's crucial that you don't see the particular politics of your place as becoming more motivational for you than the global mission that you as a Christian are called to, that I as a Christian am called to. We as the global body of Christ have a bigger campaign. We have a bigger cause to be in the business of advancing and that needs to be more important than any national political cause. Uh, something that I like to say uh, is that we, you and I, uh, on different continents, in different nations, in different political contexts, we actually have something in common in Christ, if we're both Christians, that is more profound than what I have in common with my next door neighbor who maybe shares my political views, who is not a Christian. Like, because we are not Christian, he doesn't share my faith, we actually have less in common than you and I have in common, even though I've never met you, right? So we need to remember that our unity as the body of Christ, just through the blood of Christ, through the fact that we will be together in eternity, worshiping Jesus side by side, that is a deeper bond than any sort of political unity that we can find in, in this life. So I would just challenge you, care about political causes, but make sure that the cause of Christ matters more to you. Okay, number five. I'm at the end of my, my talk. I'm, I'm ending here. And this is a big one, and this is um, kind of a nuanced one, so track with me here. Um, I'm calling this challenge authenticity valued more than holiness. Authenticity is one of those words that is associated with our generation, millennials, Gen Z. It's, it, there's probably a few words that are more associated with the values of younger people today. We love authenticity, right? We can see through fake, we can see through hypocrisy. Uh, we wanna be authentic, right? And, and there are good things about that. Um, but I see some very worrisome aspects to the overvaluing of authenticity and I think for Christians, we need to be very careful that we um, don't fall into this kind of obsession about authenticity. Um, and, and the biggest one is that authenticity is problematic when it is valued more than holiness, right? When our brokenness is elevated almost like a badge of honor, like, oh, I'm so broken. That's just, this is my authentic self. I'm so messed up. And we just kind of pat each other on the back for how broken we are. And that kind of becomes a currency of relatability with one another that in a perverted way becomes more compelling to us than the unity of pursuing holiness together, right? And in the church, that's what our community should be built on that currency, the currency of Christ and Christ-likeness and all moving in that direction. But honestly, I've been in a lot of church small group contexts where it's just kind of going around in a circle and patting each other on the back. Oh, you're broken in that way. I'm broken in this way. Oh man, what a messed up, horrible world we live in. And that's, it's fine and it's good to confess those things, but we always have to be moving forward together. We always need to be growing and towards holiness and we need to see holiness as more compelling and the goal more than just sticking in our brokenness all the time and being authentic in our brokenness. A lot of people today um, would rather be affirmed as they are than formed and grown, right? Affirmation is a bigger value than formation. And that's a problem for Christian community, right? Because a church, a Christian community is decidedly not just about affirming you as you are. All of us are being called to be shaped and formed to be more and more like Jesus. And that's gonna be hard. There's gonna be some friction there because being taken from where you are and grown is never an easy process, but it's essential. And so we can't stop short 
with just affirming you as you are and your authentic kind of brokenness. We have to be pushing each other towards holiness. Another challenge with authenticity is I think sometimes it can become a little bit of an excuse for sin and sinful behavior, right? This is just who I am, right? Um, I was born this way. This is just my, it's part of my identity. It's my authentic identity. Sometimes we call sin just part of our identity, part of our authenticity. And as Christians, we need to be clear that, yes, in a fallen world, there's going to be tendencies and sinful desires and, and things like that, that that are kind of part of who we are as fallen creatures. But that's, if that's not authentic, right? Uh, that's not who we were made to be. Um, the thing about this is Jesus was the most authentic human who ever walked the face of the earth. Hopefully, as all, all Christians can agree with that statement, Jesus is the most authentic human who ever lived. And what was true about Jesus? He was perfect. He never sinned. So if that's true, if authentic humanity is Jesus, is holiness, then if we like, if we truly do value authenticity, authentic living, then we have to recognize that actually in our broken state, in our fallen state, that's, that's the inauthentic thing. To grow in the direction of Christ, to grow in the direction of holiness, is to grow in the direction of authenticity. Change is fundamental to the Christian life. And so one of the big challenges I see in our culture, for example, with sexuality and kind of the LGBT issue is um, that you can't suggest change, right? It, that's almost like a, a non-starter um, to suggest that someone where they're at with whatever sexual brokenness that they're dealing with, that they need, it would be a good thing for them to grow and change in the direction of holiness and, and, and kind of God's vision for sexuality. You can't do that. And that's because we value this kind of come as you are approach, like just embrace who you are, live your truth, and that's okay. As Christianity, we need to remember that we are nothing if not a religion that is centered on change. We are a religion of resurrection and hope, right? Isn't the spirit who raised Jesus from the dead within us? If so, we have to believe that change is possible. We have to be more compelled by that hope by the transformative work of the Spirit within us, we have to be more compelled by Christ-likeness than we are by our brokenness, whatever it is in our lives. We have to look at Jesus and say, you are the most authentic human who ever lived, and I want to become more like you. Who I am now, whatever identity I'm wearing, uh, doesn't matter as much as your identity, which is what I, as a Christ follower who bears your name, I need to be more like you. So my challenge to you, and I'll end with this, is don't let the culture tell you that you are more fully human by being broken, being messed up, by following your desires wherever they lead. You are more fully human the more you look like Jesus. Pursue Jesus. Pursue holiness, and you will become the human that you were created to be. So in closing, I just want to challenge you as the next generation of Christian leaders, like, when it comes to the culture, be okay being countercultural, right? Um, be okay being wise in an age of foolishness and too much information. Be okay being physically present in a world of disembodied virtual experiences. Be okay slowing down, being quick to listen in a sped up world that is quick to speak. Be okay being obsessed with Jesus and his kingdom vision than any political vision or politician's vision out there. And finally, be okay pursuing Jesus and pursuing holiness, even if it means denying yourself and kind of moving beyond authenticity to be more like Jesus. Be okay doing that in a world that says, just be who you are and celebrate yourself and celebrate your truth, whatever that is. Christ's truth is so much more compelling than my truth or your truth or any of our truths, right? Truth is defined by Jesus, and so we will find it the more we pursue him. So I'll leave you with that. Thank you for letting me share with you today, and I hope to see you one day in person, um, but in the meantime, God bless you. Thank you.